Well, I'd like to welcome you to our exploration of the book of Nahum. And uh, be- whenever we go into the Word of God, we always want to do it with prayer. So let's bow our hearts for our word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your Word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask you, Father, through that Spirit that you would open this book to our lives, open our hearts and lives to the book, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our coming King. As we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen. Well, the uh, book of Nahum, interesting little book. In John 7, somebody foolishly says, there's no prophets that come out of Galilee. Whoever said that in John 7 should have done his homework, because there were two at least that we know of, and that's uh, Jonah and Nahum, both of them from the Galilee, both of them called to prophesy against um, Nineveh, the capital of the world at that time. Nahum, in fact, most of us, if you visited Israel, may remember visiting Capernaum, which is Capernaum, the village of Nahum. Now, whether it was this Nahum or not, who knows? It may have been named in his honor that... that uh, different authorities have different presumptions about that. But um, basically, this is going to be a uh, book. Well, first of all, Jonah preached against Nineveh, and they repented, much to his chagrin. You may recall he was called by God to send a message to Nineveh, and he responded by trying to go the other way until God explained it to him a little more clearly, in which he ends up, of course, going there. And there are ten miracles in the book of Jonah. The, most prof- and the biggest one wasn't the fish thing. It was the repentance of Nineveh from the king on down on speculation. He, Jonah didn't go through there, repent or else. He said, 40 days and you get yours, basically. And they did on spec repent, and God spared them for a whole century. But about 60 years have gone by in Nineveh. It's, the repentance is long past. And... Uh, Nahum is now sent to Nineveh to, to describe its forthcoming destruction. Okay? Now you say, now, Nahum's sent there, and that the whole, the whole um, preachment against Nineveh is really a comfort to Judah. So many lists will categorize this as a prophet to, to the southern kingdom, to Judah, which is uh, understandable on the one hand, but the real target is you know, the focus, the subject here, will be Nineveh, its end, the decline. Of, it, it, it's a world empire, so we need to understand that. And all nations come to a point of no return. And what we're going to see here isn't the kind of situation that Jonah dealt with where they repented. The situation here is where they've gone too far, it's over, and it's coming, and it's a different message. So we want to be sen- sensitive to that. This message is about the justice of God. We don't talk about that much. We all speak, we talk about His grace and His mercy. This one is about his justice. And uh, so um, this is, in a sense, an echo of Jonah a a, a century later. So now the first mention of Nineveh, of course, is in Genesis chapter 10. It was built by Nimrod, the first world dictator. And so both Nimrod and his capital, Nineveh, become idiomatic in the Bible of the final world empire and the final, the guy we tend to call the Antichrist. And uh, so it's interesting that the first world empire, the first world dictator was Assyrian, and the last world dictator will be an Assyrian. And that's a whole other study. We did a special uh, study on that called uh, the, 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 you know, the Antichrist and Alternative View, which emphasizes Micah in chapter 5 and, Israel in cha- and Isaiah in chapter 10, several other passages, identify the Antichrist as an Assyrian, and there's a whole study there I encourage you to undertake. Now, Nimrod built Uh, Nimrod built several cities, but Nineveh was his primary capital. And uh, as we go through and look at some of the early... Hammurabi shows up in secular literature a great deal. He was the king of Babylon, but he he makes reference to Nineveh in some of the very early writings. You're talking here about roughly almost 1800 B.C. It's really back there a bit. Uh, He's succeeded by Shalmaneser III. He made uh, uh, Nineveh the base of his military operations. And during his reign, came in contact with Israel. That's in... That's not in the Bible, but it's in writings that they've discovered archaeologically. And uh, he f- made a, a coalition of kings um, and uh, makes reference to uh, that uh, he, re- he received tribute from Jehu, the son of Omri, which are 
biblical characters. So there's a place where the archaeological records and the Bible co, uh, you know, uh, co-occur, if you will. And then we get to Ashur down the third. Uh, this was when Jonah preached to the Ninevites. And uh, he, the, he, the, that king that repented was succeeded by Tiglath-Pileser uh, III, who's quite an uh, aggressive conqueror. And uh, he is followed by several others. I won't go through all of them. Shalmaneser, you'll, you'll run into. He besieged Samaria and uh, defeated it in about 722. When Samaria falls, that's the fall then of the northern kingdom. After Solomon died, there was civil war. They split in the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom called itself the house of Israel, and, uh, uh, and uh, the southern kingdom called Judah. And uh, uh, the northern kingdom goes from bad to worse and is eliminated from history and distributed uh, because the, the, what the Ninevites did, or the, I should say the Assyrians did, when they captured a people, they distributed the slaves throughout their empire to avoid... To, to break down their ethnic cohesion and uh, interesting policy. And so the, the members of the tribes obviously didn't. Uh, uh, they, they just lost their corporate identity is my point, where I'm getting at. Prior to that event, what most people don't understand is the faithful to the temple had migrated in First Chronicles 11. They, they migrated down to the southern uh, house because that's where it was politically correct to worship at the temple. If you wanted to be an idol worshiper, you went north. So the, don't confuse the geographic descriptions of the territory with the ethnic tribal, because that is commingled by then. So members of all 12 tribes were in the south, and the Levites obviously went south, where it was politically correct to be temple worship and so forth. So this idea of 10 lost nations is a, is a myth of literature and a misunderstanding of, of the biblical text. But uh, anyway, uh, it's a shamanizer that... Uh, is attacks uh, Samaria and defeats it in 722 B.C., and that eliminates the northern kingdom from history. Uh, he's followed by Sennacherib, who is famous because he tried to invade Judah, and but God uh, made it quite clear to him that uh, that was not in his, his program. And so one angel, one night, slaughters 185,000 Syrians, to make a point, <laughs> and from that time on, they didn't attack Judah anymore. Very strange to understand how the southern kingdom, which is going, they had a couple of good kings, but they're also downhill, and they ultimately go into captivity, but only for 70 years, not permanently. And uh, the reason they're sanctioned or protected, if you will, favored, is not because they deserve it. The Scripture makes that very clear. It's because of God's commitment to David. And that's going to be very, very important when you begin to understand the kingdom and what that's really all about. So... Anyway, uh, moving on, uh, in 2 Kings 19, uh, Thus saith the Lord, concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. See, God has declared, this is in 2 Kings 19, protection, if you will, of Judah here. So it's uh, not going to be like the northern kingdom which got wiped out. God says, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. Eighty-five thousand for those of you who want to go through the map. Uh, and when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. That's an interesting sentence. <laughs> when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Now, that may sound like a grammatical problem. What I believe happened, there were more than 185,000 Syrians there. I understand uh, in wartime, the Turks were fond of sneaking into a camp and killing every other person. The next morning, they re the ones that were left who carried the message back home created a legend, if you will. And I suspect there's a parallel situation here. 104, 104, 104 score, 80, and 5,000. But there were others that when they arose, they realized their buddies, uh, you know, that would create an impression that would be somewhat lasting. Anyway, Sennacherib, the king of Syria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And so uh, that after Sennacherib, we have Esarhaddon, and, uh, and he regarded Judah as a vassal kingdom. And uh, there's re records where he summoned the kings of the Hittite land, the Ar Aram, or what we think of Assyria, and... Uh, uh, 
also the king of Tyre and Manasseh, the king of Judah, is mentioned in his own writings. And so, again, we have archaeological parallels here for what it's worth. He's succeeded by Asher Banipal, and uh, uh, so it, 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 uh, he's the one that ends up uh, releasing Manasseh, the king of Judah, uh, from tribute and so forth. And uh, he defeated Thebes in Egypt in about uh, 683 and brought treasures to Nineveh from Thebes and so forth. So Nineveh is the, I should say, well, it's the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And we'll take a look at that here in a minute. But uh, the subject of this prophecy in Nahum is the approaching complete and final destruction of Nineveh. It's the capital of the great dominant empire of the world at that time, and, uh, which was at, at, had been flourishing. So at 90, roughly 903 B.C. we have the rise of Nineveh. And then in uh, 759 is when Jonah does his thing. And then uh, 722 is the destruction of the northern kingdom itself. And 709 is the invasion of Sennacherib's attempt to Judah. But the prophecy of Nahum is about 663, to give you a feeling. It's roughly a century after Jonah's uh, prophecy. There's about a century between them. And so, so Nineveh, you need to understand is a city of vast extent. And we'll talk about that here in a, in a little bit here. It was a city of commerce, but also a city that it was a bloody city known of, for uh, uh, robbery and plunder, and it was strongly fortified on every side, and uh, it uh, was regarded as impregnable. But it was utterly destroyed as punishment for the great wickedness of its inhabitants, is what we're going to see here. So at 625, Assyria gets... Theirs. So it's roughly uh, a century after the northern kingdom has gone down, just to give you a rough feeling for the timing here. And so uh, Jonah had already, you know, given his message a century before, and they had repented, but here we are now. Uh, I'll give you a feeling of the extent of this. The Syrian Empire included Egypt and all the way to Media, or Elam, or what we know of today as, as uh, Persia. And uh, so uh, it, it, one of its major cities was Babylon, and Babylon will grow powerful enough to take over to make, create the Babylonian Empire, but that's later, that's later. Aram is the area we think of as Syria. Assyria, of course, is, this, is to the east of there. Don't confuse Assyria with Syria, if you will. Syria is a modern term for really what in ancients would be called Aram, but for whatever it is, okay. And Nineveh is the capital of this, of the primary world empire at that time. Okay. And Babylon and Susa are down in the south. Damascus is almost, is, is close to, uh, to Israel. Uh, Memphis and Thebes be the major cities in Egypt. And of course, Jerusalem in the southern part there. So that gives you just a rough feeling for the, the geography. Uh, Samaria is just north of Jerusalem. is the capital of the northern kingdom, now extant, now gone. And... Uh, on we go here. I'll give you a little closer look at it. Here's Baghdad, Babylon. Mosul is a modern city. Nineveh is just across the river from that. The ruins uh, are, you can visit still today. Uh, it's kind of interesting. In the days of uh, Alexander the Great, Nineveh was regarded as a legend. They did, they, it was so th 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 thoroughly destroyed that it was considered a legend. And uh, Alexander the Great walked over that dust, not knowing under him was an actual city of Nineveh that was later discovered and confirmed uh, as we'll see all unfold here. Uh, the uh, modern Mosul is on the west side of the river, the Tigris River, and on the east side is the city of Nineveh. And it's all recorded in Genesis 10. We don't have to go through all that here, I guess. But that's, the Nineveh was gigantic. Um, and uh, it was uh, uh, large. And like Babylon, it was protected by outer walls as well as an inner wall. And the inner wall was 50 feet wide and over 100 feet high. You could, three chariots could, could race on the top of their wall. And uh, so uh, it was uh, located on the east bank. Uh, it's just to repent. It's about 550 miles from Samaria, which tells you that Jonah probably spent a month walking there. It's 550 miles is a long walk on foot. Um, so uh, it, it was, uh, uh, the inner wall was uh, 50 feet wide, 100 feet high. There's that three chariots raced on top. It had 1,200 towers 200 feet high. This was a, in, in ancient times, by any man's standard, this is pretty impressive uh, embattlements. 60 miles in circumference, and they had a, a population of about 600,000 that was supported by crops inside the walls. 
to get a picture of this thing. And there's been renderings of this in art, but those are speculative on the part of artists. But So let's jump into Nahum chapter 1, verse 1, and realize this is intended to be a comfort to, uh, to, to uh, Judah. And uh, so the, the, these terrible judgments are payment to Nineveh for their atrocities that they're famous for. And so uh, the, uh, it's, it, during much of Manasseh's reign, he paid tribute to Nineveh, by the way. You need to understand the power of this. Uh, the, and, the, and the primary purpose of the book of Nahum is to announce the, the fall of Nineveh and thereby comfort Judah with the assurance that God is in control in both sides. In the sense, control in the sense he's punishing them for their, their abuses, but it's also he's in control of protecting Judah from their, from, from their abuses. So I'll jump in. Chapter 1, verse 1, The Burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the name, by the way, means consolation or comfort, by the way, as an aside. And uh, God is jealous, and the Lord re- revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So there we jump right in. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. So Nahum starts right off you know, laying it on, on, on the line here. Uh, God is the moral ruler of the universe, is the point. And uh, there is, he is a righteous judge. That's what's, what is going to come. And penalties must be paid, is the basic thought here. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good and a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Wow, this, you know, Nahum's laying it on the line. You know, we, we, especially as New Testament readers, we emphasize God's grace and mercy. But there's another side to understand that God is just, and that's what's going to emerge here in the, the flavor of Nahum as we go forward. He continues, What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they be drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down, and he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now will I break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds asunder." So, see, uh, uh, another way to phrase this is, even though your entire nation joins in as one person to resist me, nevertheless, I shall overcome you. So, uh, he's, he's, he's going to succeed, obviously. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. You know, that's scary language coming from God. Behold, upon the mountains of the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. So again, I get the flavor here. Nahum is addressing this, or God is addressing through Nahum, this against Nineveh, but it, not the total reason, but part of it is the comfort of Judah. So uh, well, let's go in chapter 2. This is the, he's going to really focus now. This, that was the warm-up. Now we're going to ju- the judgment on, uh, uh, on Nineveh itself. And uh, so, He that dasheth in pieces has come up before thy face. Keep the munition. Watch the way. Make thy loins strong. Fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariot shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. The chariot shall rage in the streets. Some people say that's a prediction of traffic in the Bible. I think that's a 
you know, uh, that's imputed. I don't see it saying that. Anyway, the chariot shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broad ways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste in the, uh, to the wall thereof, and the defense shall be prepared. The gates of the river shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. And uh, so what actually happened, the Tigris actually overflowed. It took out a section of the wall, and the city became like a pool of water. Two and a half miles of the wall were along the Tigris, and that was its downfall uh, uh, as they go down. Huzzab shall be led away captive and shall be brought up, and her maid shall lead her as with the voice of doves tapering upon their breasts. But Nineveh is of, it is of old like a pool of water, yet sh they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. Take ye spoil of silver, take ye spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store and the glory out of all the pleasant furniture. And so that obviously... Uh, uh, it's collapsing. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. Where is the dwelling of the lions, and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, even the old lion, walked, and the lions whelped, and none made them afraid? The lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps, and strangled for his lionesses, and filled his holes with prey, and his dens with ravens. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord. If you didn't get the picture, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard. Wow. Why is this going on? Chapter 3. Woe to the bloody city. See, that's an interesting label to give you a flavor of Nineveh. You're the capital of the world, but Woe to the bloody city. And we read this. I'm trying to resist the temptation, but as we read this, you can draw your own inferences as this descriptive of New York or Washington or our society itself. And I don't, I, 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 we don't have to go through statistics of the murders and all that that's going on in our cities, but there are more, more crimes in New York than about nine cities in Europe, nine city, uh, countries in Europe. Uh, if you go through it, I don't want to derail the Bible study here, but it's astonishing to compare the violence in our own major, major cities with countries across the ocean. Anyway, woe to the bloody city, it is all full of lies and robbery, and the prey departeth not. The noise of the whip, and the noise of the rattling of wheels, and of the prancing of horses, and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifted up both bright sword and glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. So the whole story here is violence and cruelty. And Asher ben Ansirpal the second boasted, quote, I stormed the mountain peaks and took them in the midst of the mighty mountain. I slaughtered them with their blood. I dyed the mountain red like wool. The heads of their warriors I cut off and I formed them into a pillar over against the city. Their young men and their maidens I burned in the fire. And regarding one captured leader, he wrote, I flayed him, his skin I spread upon the wall of the city. And he also spoke of mutilating the bodies of the, the live captives and stacking their corpses in piles and so forth. This is just Shalmaneser II boasted of his cruelties after one of his campaigns. A pyramid of heads I reared in front of his city. Their youths and their maidens I burned up in the flames. And Sennacherib wrote of his enemies. I cut their throats like lambs. I cut off their precious lives as one cuts a string. Like the many waters of a storm, I made the, the contents of their gullets and their entrails run down upon the wide earth. Their hands I cut off. That gets graphic. This goes, it gets, you get the flavor here. And uh, Asher, Penapal also. The all, the, these guys all brag about this. I pierced his chin with my keen hand dagger. Through his jaw I passed a rope and put a dog chain upon him and made him occupy a kennel. You know, if you go to the London Museum, you'll see the Assyrian uh, carvings and, and, and celebrating the way they abused their captives. In his campaign against Egypt, Ashurbanipal 
uh, boasted that his officials hung Egyptian corpses, quote, on stakes and stripped off their skins and covered the city walls with them. Well, let's move on, chapter 3, verse 4. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of the witchcrafts, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts, behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. You know, even in the King James, it's pretty graphic, isn't it? And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. And who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? Art thou better than the populous Noamon that was situate among the rivers, that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea and her wall was from the sea? Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lumen were thy helpers. Yet was she carried away, she went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets, and they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid, thou also seek strength because of the enemy. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe uh, figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Now this, this language of Nehem, it was about another 40 years before it happens. This is all written down in advance of the actual judgment. It's a prophetic passage, obviously. Draw thee waters from the siege, fortify thy strongholds, go into the clay and tread the mortar and make strong the brick killing. There shall, be, there shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like a canker worm, make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself as many as the locusts. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven, the canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Thy crowned are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great hat grasshoppers which camp in the hedges in the cold day, but when the sun riseth, they shall flee away, and their place is not known where they are. You know, especially in the book of Joel, you want to study our book of Joel, we get into the locusts, there's four different kinds and all that, and they were, uh, even, even the Quran speaks of the locusts as the army of God. These things are uh, uh, well known in the Middle East and terrifying, and they're used here literally as locusts, but they're also used idiomatically in, in other places, like Revelation 9 and elsewhere to speak of, of the demons. And there's a whole side study we can get into. But here it's, it's pretty graphic, pretty direct. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the fruit of thee shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? In other words, the world is going to celebrate the fall of this evil capital of that empire. So, a number of prophecies in here. I've separated them this way. The Assyrian fortresses surrounding the city would be easily captured. That was in chapter 3, verse 12. Well, the Babylonian Chronicle records that the fortified towns in Nineveh's environs began to fall in 614 B.C., including Tabris, the present-day Sharif Khan, a few miles northwest of Nineveh. Another second one, the besieged Ninevites would prepare bricks and mortar for emergency defense walls. That's also in the 14th verse of chapter 3. Well, in, in the history of Assyria uh, published by Olmsted, he points out that to the south of the gate, the moat is still filled with fragments of stone and mud bricks from the walls heaped up when they were breached. Third one, the city gates would be destroyed. The main attack was directed from the northwest and the brunt fell upon the Hatamti gate at this corner. Within the gate are the traces of the counter wall raised by the inhabitants in their last extremity. Fourth one, in the final hours of the attack, the Ninevites would be drunk. We saw that in chapter 1 and chapter 3. Well, Diodorus Seculus, uh, in his Bibliotheca Historia, records, quote, the Assyrian king distributed to his soldiers meats and liberal supplies of wine and provisions. While the whole army was thus arousing, the uh, friends and Arbakes 
learned from some deserters of the slackness and drunkenness which prevailed in the enemy's camp, and they made an unexpected attack by night. So that's a part of the record. The fifth prophecy, Nineveh would be destroyed by a flood. That was in chapter 1 and chapter 2, twice, twice. In the third year of the siege, heavy rains caused the nearby river to flood part of the city and break apart the walls. Xenophon refers to the terrifying thunder, presumably with a storm associated with the city's capture in his writings. Also the Kozar River entering the city from the northwest at the Ninnaya Gate uh, and running through the city on a southwest direction it may have flooded because of heavy rains and the enemy may have destroyed the Sluice Gate. A sixth one, Nineveh would be destroyed by fire. And that's in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and cha all three chapters make reference to this. And according to uh, uh, Thompson and Hutchison's their writings, archaeological excavations at Nineveh have revealed charred wood, charcoal, and ashes. There was no question about the clear traces of burning of the temple, uh, which was also the palace of Sennacherib, uh, for a layer of ash about two inches thick lay clearly defined in places on the southeast side about the level of the Sargon pavement. The seventh one, the city's capture would be attended by a great massacre of people, chapter 3. Well, that's no surprise either. In two battles fought on the plain before the city, the rebels defeated the Assyrians. So great was the multitude of the slain that the flowing stream mingled with their blood changed its color from, uh, for a considerable distance. The eighth prophecy, plundering and pillaging would accompany the overthrow of the city. That was emphasized in chapter 2. The Babylonian Chronicle quotes, great quantities of spoil from the city beyond counting. They were carried off the city. They turned into a mound and a ruin heap. And uh, Nineveh would be captured, its people, uh, uh, when Nineveh was, would be captured, its people would try to escape. And, uh, and there's records confirming that also. The tenth one, the Ninevites' officers would weaken and flee, no surprise. The Babylon Chronicle makes references, the army of the Assyria deserted uh, the king, no surprise. Nineveh's images and idols would be destroyed, of course. Chapter 1 emphasizes that. And the statue of the goddess Ishtar lay headless in the debris of Nineveh's ruins, according to Thompson and Hutchinson's reports. And the final one, Nineveh's destruction would be final. Now that's interesting. How, how would Nahum know that? And yet that is, in other words, centuries later, there, was, there, there were many centuries where they didn't even believe there even was a Nineveh it was later discovered by archaeologists. And so, uh, see, many cities that were destroyed in, through the Middle East were rebuilt after being destroyed, like Samaria and Jerusalem, but not Nineveh. And I think that's the, that kind of prophecy really fascinates me because that's final and confirmed, if you will. So, it's interesting, as you study your Bible, there's a phrase that continually reoccurs. You find it in Deuteronomy 12, Judges 17, Judges 21, Proverbs 12, and Proverbs 21. You find this familiar sentence, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. When you see that out of context, that seems fine. Everybody did what they thought was right. No, 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 no. That means, what that really means, where you see it in context, is that everybody did what they thought was right. There was, there was lawlessness. It is a statement in the Bible of how bad things got. Everybody did what they thought was right. Now, we need to get, get to understand, you know, that out of context, you know, gee, that sounds okay. No, no. That means it's the, it's the utter nadir of morality. That's, just, that's as bad as it gets where everybody does what they think's right. In other words, absolutely no fear of God is the thought that's embodied in that sentence. And that's obviously what prevailed through Nineveh, but also in modern times. It's interesting that Thomas Jefferson in 1781 writes, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, and that His justice cannot sleep forever. And uh, there is a cycle of nations. There's a half a dozen scholars through the centuries that have written about the life cycle of nations. They, get, they start, they go through a cycle, and they end. They don't last forever. And that cycle, uh, 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 I'll just quote from Alexander Tyler's in 1781, uh, uh, I think it was. Uh, they go from bondage, 
to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, and from abundance to complacency, from complacency to apathy, and from apathy to dependency, and from that dependency back again to bondage. That was Ellie. That, and, and all the people, whether you're talking uh, Parkinson or uh, Toynbee, all the people that have studied history come to the same conclusions. Basically the same, there's a, there's a life cycle. And the uh, question is, where are we? Let's take a look at the cycle. We start in bondage through spiritual faith, brings great courage. That courage can achieve liberty. That liberty will lead to abundance, and that's exactly the history of our country in America. And in fact, that's the problem. If we create an abundance, that's the envy of the world. Watch out for envy, the Scripture talks about. Because that abundance leads to complacency. And that complacency leads to apathy. And I love to challenge my audiences. Go down the street and ask the first person you meet, what's the biggest problem in America? Is it ignorance or is it apathy? The person's likely to say, I don't know and I don't care. And of course, that leads to dependency. And we've now reached a place where over half the population is on the government dole. And the other half pays for it. That's a dangerous, dangerous thing to have in a democracy because in a democracy is, it's unstable because the voters soon discover that they can enrich themselves at the public trough and that's unstable. That's why democracies are to be avoided. That's why our founding fathers worked very hard to create protections against a democracy to have a republic. But that's been lost, of course. And so that brings us back to bondage. Well, is it twilight's last gleaming? That's a question. Do these prophets suspect? Now, I encourage you to study the book of Hosea, chapter 4 through 14 particularly, or the book of Amos. The parallels between the northern kingdom and the America are astonishing, but you need to dis discover those for yourselves. And if the parallels are parallel, what did God do about the northern kingdom? He used their enemies as his instrument of judgment. And as I travel, uh, the, and we always have a question and answer period, the predictable question that will come up is where's American prophecy? And anyone that studies eschatology knows that all the players are well identified. America's conspicuous in its absence of mention. That's what brings the question. But the second question that usually accompanies that is why hasn't God judged America? Tough question. Billy Graham quipped several decades ago very cleverly. God doesn't judge America. He's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Great soundbite. Good question. And that's one of the questions we need to ask ourselves because we live in the age of deceit. Most Americans think we're the richest country in the world. That's not true. We're bankrupt. Our lifestyle depends on borrowing from foreigners. And once you realize that, and you also realize those central banks are not, they're not stupid. They realize they're never going to get repaid. So there's, there's going to be huge, huge global upheavals forthcoming. America's only hope. Robert Bork in his book Slouching Towards Gomorrah says the only hope for America is a grassroots revival. America's problem isn't military. America's problem isn't financial. Those are symptoms, not a cause. Any businessman knows that cash flow is a result of something. It's not the cause of something. Yeah, and and uh, cash flow is an indication <coughs> of something else that's wrong. And Amer America's problem is moral. We need a grassroots revival. So that gives you the verse for the day, and it isn't in Nahum, it happens to be in 2 Chronicles 7.14. Many people are surprised to discover that God appeared to Solomon. We know many of his other parents, but he appeared to Solomon, and he, did, he, he announced something to Solomon. He said, if my people who are called by my name, if they shall do four things, I'll do three. He says, if, they, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now the, the purist will say, no, wait a minute, Chuck, that was given to Solomon in reference to Israel, absolutely. But what's also denotative is also connotative because we have a God that, that uh, is immutable, doesn't change. And he's announcing a principle here. If my people who are called by my name, how many of you out there are God's people? Can I see your show of hands? 
Got about 90%. That's pretty good. And I'm kidding, of course. Okay. But wait a minute. If my people who are called by my name. Now, I have to be a little uh, cautious here because some of you may be the best undercover Christians the world's ever seen. Your family, the people at work, never suspect you're sold out to Christ. If you were on trial for being a Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict you. Now, I hope I'm being facetious. God says, if my people who are called by my name, aha, do four things. If they shall humble themselves. We know how to do that. Well, the most humble person here, please raise your hand. No, I'm, no I am kidding. Okay. No, we know how to be humble. We may not do it enough, but we know how to do that. That's not, that's not science. That's easy. Just It's a commitment. If they shall humble themselves and pray. We know how to pray. We don't do it enough. If my people are called my name, will humble themselves and pray, ah, and seek my face. Now, that's not a head thing. That's a commitment thing. That's, that's the kind of thing you indulged in when you were courting your spouse. If my people are called my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face. Ah, here's the rub. And turn from their wicked ways. It's really a shock to realize who this is addressed to. This is not addressed to the Congress, the president of the country. It's not addressed to the executives that run our entertainment industry. This is not addressed to the pagan left in the corridors of power. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, the sins that are in the way of God doing what He'd prefer to do are the sins within the body of Christ. That's who this is addressed to in our, in, in our vernacular. If my people are called by name, will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Apparently not until then, in a corporate sense. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You always want to remember the Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1.9 if we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's His faithfulness we can depend on, not ours. His. Then will I hear from Him and it will forgive their sin and heal their land. Devoutly to be wished. Okay, well that's our rather superficial excursion through the writings of Nahum. But I always like to leave you with a challenge. You come to these studies and, and, and uh, hopefully learn some things, hopefully get motivated. Uh, uh, if it doesn't impact your priorities, you may have wasted an hour here. I, I hope it does. But I want to give you a challenge. I'm going to put something on the screen that I believe sincerely, but if you accept what I put on the screen, you flunk the course. You ready for this? If you accept what follows, you, this is a preposterous proposition, you'll flunk the course. You and I, I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in human history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and climbed the mountain Judea. Now that, that's a preposterous statement, that you and I are moving into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history. That's a preposterous statement. And if you accept that, you flunk, because I want you to challenge that. That's, that's too important to just Sean, you, you got a chance. How are you going to do that? You got to do two things. The first thing you got to do, you got to find out what the Bible says. That's too important to delegate to a pastor or a friend or to your favorite TV person, whatever. No. You need to find out what the Bible actually says. It's too important. You can't delegate that to others. Jesus himself said that not one yacht or one tittle shall pass from the Torah until all be fulfilled. Now, a yacht or a tittle is a Hebrew way, the equivalent in our would be the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T. Jesus called you to take the text seriously. If you're reading a paraphrase, that might be useful devotionally, but I can still remember Walter Martin leaning over the, the pulpit saying, you would paraphrase God? <laughs> no, you want to get as close to... Now see, in today's world, we have a unique environment. Did you realize that you can go to the original Greek and Hebrew without knowing Greek or Hebrew? There is software, on your computer software, you put your little arrow on any word and it'll, a little box will pop up and tell you what the word actually was, what part of speech, singular, plural, what, it'll even diagram the sentence if you want. 
And the software to do that is free. If you don't have a, 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 the software, you can do it on the internet. Check out the Blue Letter Bible and, and there's packages like that. We are in an era in which the Word of God is more available than it's ever been in human history. Many of us carry a half a dozen different Bibles in our phone, we're going out loud, or its equivalent. The information appliances we have today are astonishing and improving. Uh, hardly a week goes by when there isn't an additional bake- breakthrough making us more capable with information. Today, sitting at a computer terminal, you can in 30 minutes do what used to take a pastor six months of study. You can put your, you, you can put any question there and it'll, the computer will find the answers for you and put it together for you. You know how to use it. And the internet research, do you realize that all of man's knowledge, all of man's knowledge is only a couple of keystrokes away from you? If you know how to use the internet, you can find out anything. It's an incredible resource that's growing uh, hour by hour. Now in all of this, I, 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 you're talking about finding out what the Bible says, in my 65 years of studying the Bible, the place I have seen people grow is always in one particular mode. It's in a small group. Not listening to a sermon 45 minutes on Sunday morning, I'm not disparaging that, I'm just saying it's not sufficient. If you want to get serious about the Bible, many of us have the discipline to do it by ourselves, and I applaud that, except most of us prosper by doing it in a small group from six to twelve people. Small enough that you can ask questions without embarrassment. Small enough so you hold each other accountable. That's where people grow. And meeting during the week, small group, and watch the Holy Spirit take over. You don't have to be a teacher to lead a small group. Pop a DVD in and watch it and discuss it among yourselves. And have somebody chair it so that one person doesn't dominate and all that sort of thing. There's some, there's some simple things you do to make it effective, but the point is, small group during the week. We really encourage you to do that. Okay, that's part one. Find out what the Bible says. Part two is a whole different act. Find out what's really going on. One of the things that makes our think tank, Coyne Institute, distinctive from a Bible college, say, is there are parallel avenues of study. We call the Berean Avenue. That's the study of the Bible, verse by verse, cover to cover, Lifetime deal. Never ends. But there's a second parallel path, which we call the Issachar. We call the first one Berean, after the Bereans, Acts 17.11. The second avenue is is called the Issachar uh, path, or avenue of study, after 1 Chronicles 12.32. To be like the sons of Issachar, in that they understood the times and knew what their country had to do. That's the study of what we would call prophecy. That's the study of stewardship. It turns out, we've learned, that the tools and resources of those two study, avenues of study are antithetical to each other. When you study the Bible, you know it's true. The challenge is to understand it. Fine. In the other avenue of study, what you're dealing with are news clips, intelligence reports, things that you know are not necessarily true. They're biased, sometimes inadvertently, sometimes deliberately. So how do you deal with it? How do you find out what's really going on? You certainly don't by listening to the 10 o'clock news. In America, we've finally woken up to the reality that our media takes pride in shaping opinions rather than informing them. The purpose of the press in a democracy is to inform the electorate. Our major mainline media should be tried for treason because they deliberately withheld the truth from the people in the previous election. Now, that's maybe a time for us to mature enough to understand that it takes some maturity to understand information. We need to understand what we're doing because these people we're unhappy with are our employees. We need to understand that. You know, find out what's going on. We, remember Pilate so cynically asked, what is truth? That's the challenge. What is true? We live in the age of deceit. What is Satan's number one weapon? Deceit. Deceit. So we need to re- deal with that. So we live in the age of deceit. Okay, what's your action plan? Does this make sense to you? How many of you are saved? Can I see a show of hands again? Why? Why did God save you? For a purpose. purpose. Exactly right. There's a collective purpose to magnify His name and so forth. There's also an individual purpose. I think you can prove that every one of us was saved for a specific mission. 
And the adventure in life is to discover what it is. Find out what God has called you to do and then roll up your sleeves and get to it. What is God calling you to do? I'm going to suggest that every one of us in this room, me included, are a work in progress. He's not finished with any of us. And every one of us need to raise the bar on our personal walk. I'm going to suggest that every one of us needs to commit to a systematic program to really learn your Bible. It may include some other things too, but I know it will include that. If you're going to grow spiritually, that's going to be part of it. Well, I read it every day. That's devotional reading. I take that for granted. No, I'm talking about systematic study. Verse by verse, cover by cover. So I believe you sh- if you can't fi- find a s- small group and join it, or if you can't find one, start one. But whatever you do, respond to His calling now. Well, with that, let's just, uh, have a closing prayer. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this time together. We thank You for the, the, the uh, prophecies of Nahum. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit you would help us understand what relevance it has to us in our own predicament today. Yes, that there is a life cycle of nations and they have a a twilight, an end. Help us to understand that, Father. Help us to understand that you are a God of justice in addition to grace and mercy. So we do pray, Father, that you would help each of us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that you would make us more effective stewards of the opportunities that come before us that in all these things we might, more, might be more pleasing in thy sight. As we right here, right now, commit ourselves without any reservations whatsoever into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen.